Good evening. It is good to be together on this Saturday evening. My name is Karen Wright Marsh. I'm the Executive Director of Theological Horizons, and it is my great pleasure and delight to welcome you here uh, into this space this evening. Um, on behalf of Theological Horizons and the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia, I welcome you. This is uh, the final CAPS lecture in Christian theology. Since 2001, the CAPS lecture series has brought eminent Christian thinkers to the heart of the university, often into this room, to explore the relationship between faith and responsibility. So I'd like to say at first a word of thanks to Dr. and Mrs. W. Jerry Capps for their great generosity in making this possible. We're grateful for Trinity Presbyterian Church and for 12 Ridges Vineyards for hosting tonight's lovely gathering, the reception in particular. I'd like to thank Ms. Sherry Winston, our Associate Director for the Rotunda, for her hospitality in this historic space and for welcoming us here. I'd like to thank Charles Marsh, the Director of the Project on Live Theology, and the Lilly Endowment for their generous support and championing this event and this weekend. I thank also the friends and the partners of Theological Horizons, especially the board members who are with me tonight. Uh, we are an organization that supports Christians and seekers in academia by providing a welcoming community for engaging faith, thought, and life. And that is what we hope to do tonight. This event is being live streamed uh, on Facebook and at theologicalhorizons.org. It will be archived there so you can relive the magic. Um, and many of us will gather again tomorrow at 3 o'clock with Dr. Perkins at the Martin Luther King Performing Arts Center here in Charlottesville at the high school. There is a postcard in your, uh, at, on your chair, so please come join us tomorrow at 3. There's no space limit, and babies and children are welcome, and there will be music by the Charlottesville Worship Collective. So I hope you'll join us then. Our theme this evening is Dream With Me parting words on race and love. So you are in store for an hour or so of music, of inspiration, and conversation with Dr. John M. Perkins and Dr. Nathan Walton. We don't know if these are actually his parting words, but Dr. Perkins is turning 90 this spring, so this is a wonderful opportunity for you to hear his wisdom to you tonight. We've come together in the dome room of the rotunda, the very heart of the University of Virginia, an institution with a storied and a complex history. We've come together at a time, like many other times in history, a time of conflict, of mistrust, of division. And so we come together tonight to witness, to listen in on a conversation between Dr. Perkins and Dr. Nathan Walton. More than 50 years separate these two. They've lived very different lives, and yet, across the divides of time, experience, education, and perspective, Dr. Perkins and Dr. Walton will model for us their commitment to both shared purpose and to true inclusion across difference. They will show us authentic conversation through turbulent waters and topics. So we get to be witnesses to this exchange and are invited into this dream of love. So in a real way, I think our gathering here in this space tonight is a beautiful response to a letter that President Jim Ryan, a statement he put out to the university community this week. Here are a few of his words to us. He says, universities are among the most diverse communities in our country. We too often assume that these are easy places to navigate. They aren't. Inclusion at th this stage of human progress is complicated and a bit messy. It's not linear. It's not altogether consistent. It's about both bonding with your people, however defined, and bridging to meet and develop relationships with those who are not yet your people. What we can try to do as a university is to enable students, by the time they leave this place, to have a much broader view 
of who they consider their people. One of the best ways, he says, to bring a community together is to have a common purpose. Part of fostering inclusion is fostering a shared sense of purpose. And finally, President Ryan says this, this does not mean that we all agree on the best ways of improving the world, and that's as it should be in a university. But if we can commit ourselves to the fundamental idea that we are here in part to learn to serve, I believe we can be one of the most inclusive universities that has ever existed. And I say, may it be so. Where we are connected to a larger common community, he says, dedicated to serving the world beyond UVA in one way or another. And so here we are to begin this shared purpose and to express this through our conversation tonight. So I thank you for coming into this space, into the dome room with a spirit of expectation, a spirit of hope, a listening ear to these parting words on race and love. So I'm going to introduce briefly Dr. Nathan Walton, and then we'll have some music uh, to warm us up. We're already warm, but to celebrate this, this occasion together. Um, our friends Nadine Michelle, Lauren Stone Street, and Dominique DeBose will bring some music and probably some more of your friends. Have, oh yeah, hey, have joined your little band. Um, so a word about Dr. Nathan Walton, and he will introduce um, Dr. Perkins. Nathan Walton is the Executive Director of Charlottesville Abundant Life Ministries. He holds a Master's of Divinity from Duke University, a BA and a PhD from the University of Virginia. Nathan, as you will see, brings energy to everything he does, to the work of theology, partner building, vision casting, community development, and parish ministry. So I welcome all of you, and of course, to Dr. Perkins and to Dr. Walton. Um, as we gather tonight. Thank you. Were you 
tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the stone was rolled away? Were you there? Shame is a prison as cruel as the grave, and shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground, and love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no
give them another round of applause. Yeah. Amazing. So let me first begin by saying thank you again to Karen for that warm introduction. Again, my name is Nathan Walton, and I'm the executive director of Abundant Life Ministries here in Charlottesville, and I'm also the pastor of Formation and Discipleship at Charlottesville Vineyard Church. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's distinguished guest, Dr. John M. Perkins. Dr. Perkins was born in 1930 in a small town in Mississippi called New Hebron. And as you can imagine, growing up as an African-American man in the Jim Crow South, this brought a full range of challenges and struggles. For Dr. Perkins, some of those challenges included witnessing police brutality. That included the murder of his own brother. And later that would include his own wrongful imprisonment and beating at the hands of racist police officers, almost to the point of death. Yet throughout all these challenges, Dr. Perkins would come to find healing and hope in the message of the Christian gospel, which would provide him with a theological framework for what it meant to love God, to love his neighbor, and to love his enemy, even those who almost took his life. After initially moving away from Mississippi in 1947, he later felt called by God to return in 1960 to his hometown. And Dr. Perkins would embark on a lifelong investment in community development work, from launching a Bible institute called Voice of Calvary with the help of his wife, Vera Mae Perkins, to organizing civil rights boycotts and voter registrations, to establishing health clinics and a range of co-ops to promote economic development. Dr. Perkins has established a long legacy of significant community work. What has been beautiful about this process is that while Dr. Perkins' ministry has had an immeasurable impact on Mississippi, it would also provide a framework for Christian community development that would be adapted around the country. Some of the principles that shaped Dr. Perkins' work have become known as the three R's. Relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. Relocating to an under-resourced community, especially if it's a community from which you've originally come. Promoting reconciliation within that community, especially across racial and other lines. And promoting redistribution and equitable access to resources and power. Dr. Perkins would eventually co-found the Christian Community Development Association, CCDA for short, and these principles will become key to its guiding philosophy. To date, CCDA now resources nearly 700 nonprofits and churches and other community development organizations around the country, of which Abundant Life is one. And um, countless lives have been and continue to be shaped and changed by this work. Tonight, we actually have the privilege of joining in that group of people who have been shaped by this work. Some of my hopes for this evening or that we would not only leave tonight with a deeper understanding of Dr. John Perkins' life and legacy and vocational vision, but that we would all each leave this event changed. That we would leave with a clearer vision for what loving our neighbor really looks like, what it requires of us. That we would leave more equipped to engage in the work of healing the divides that too often define and separate us in our society and that we will become even more deeply captivated by the sheer power of love. So tonight we're going to have a conversation. I'm excited. I hope you are. The conversation will begin uh, with Dr. Perkins giving some opening words, and then we'll have a conversation between him and I. And then we'll allot some time for Q&A as well. So we'll be thinking about your questions. So with that being said, please join me again in welcoming Dr. John Perkins. challenges in 
opportunity to reignite the greatest dream that it's been extracted from the Bible. And that y'all have organized with the idea of trying to reflect that beloved community, that reflection of the kingdom of God. And reflecting that meaning of the image of God was that this one humanity was to reflect God in the world. That's the great thought of Moses. The Lord thy God is one, and we would have no other God before him. The dream was the American dream. It was long after the Magna Carta that this great dream was dreamed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all humankind was created equal and was endowed by their creator with certain rights. Chief among those is life, <clears throat> liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Martin Luther King used that same biblical statement as the founding fathers. They killed him, but they didn't kill the dream. We can continue the igniting of that dream. It is a very dark place. The impeachment shows that we are about 50-50 divided. That would be more than we ever been. More than we ever been. And really, our Constitution is being threatened. We are on our way, look like to me, to, to genocide. That's what happens when you really become vain in your imagination. You forget what is the truth. And a lie be substituted for the truth. Hate was never supposed to be a value. It was a warning. And today we won election by how much we hate each other. And we have measured it. We have done the posting. The senators is 51 to 49. We're divided. There is a biblical thought, and Jesus said this, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So we have this wonderful opportunity to be here tonight. The test that proposition a one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I didn't push my way in here. Y'all invited me. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to follow me around. I'm not going to steal anything. Uh, I know I've been color coded but that's all right. That's all right. We got an opportunity to carry out that, that dream, uh, that city, that nation sitting on the hill. Martin Luther King put it that way. He said when he spoke at the great dream, he said, I come here to cash a promissory note that was made by the founding fathers. And he said it was a guarantee that everyone born in this country would be free and live with justice for all, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. He said every time we send that, get ready to cash that check, we black folks, there would always come back insufficient funds. Justice, love, and justice was the motivation for redemption. Because he said, that's an I kill, that's an I kill. Because God so loved the world 
that created his only begotten son. We got a solution. Because the lovers of God, he that loves is born of God and knoweth God. He that loves is not, knoweth not God, because God is love. So tonight, I'm here because of the invitation of the possibility that new horizon and a habitat for humanity and abundant life in the local churches could come together and do a prototype. And the church in the New Testament was a prototype. They all was different, all seven of them. They reflect the kingdom of God. It was expected that we in our city would be that city sitting on the hill. Joan Motors, a, a tussler, and any of those don't build a car until they create a sufficient model. God intended the people of God in every city to reflect that. That's what Pentecost was. That was Pentecost was. And that we done messed that up with what we call racial reconciliation. That is racist. You can't get no racist in that. Just that very thought. That, that's why integration won't work. Integration has passed. It was that time from the first black moved into a white community until the last white moved out. That's over it. We're reversing that now. We're finna do it again in the city. They're coming back. And we're going to curse each other again. What an opportunity. What an opportunity we have. And you represent that. I'm not here to curse you. I'm here to build on this initiative, this hope, this longing, to build on what's here tonight and tomorrow. And we have acted now tonight in this place, one of our founding fathers, uh, who probably agreed with that proposition but didn't know how to bring it off. Didn't know how to bring it off. We have a chance to do it. This is a moment. And the people, I'm finished, and we're going to have questions. And this is always a question. This is always a question. Do you understand the time in which you live? The Hebrew Manifesto said that. God, who had some time and died, spoke to his people in different ways, but in his last days spoken by his son, whom he made heirs of all things, by whom he created the world. Renewal is built into the church. And we have that chance to test that proposition again. I think God, and I sort of see it look like it's in Revelation 7. It seemed near the end time, and it says there was these people there, not from every race, but he said from every tribe, every ethnic group, every language, because of one race, one race. When we talk about reconciliation, we're talking about supersizing the white race. I've told you about that. And then we ask questions about whose life matters. That's an affront to God. You're talking about God. You're cursing God. Because God is life. God is life and love. He don't answer that question, whose life matters. Black life matters. Uh, that's from the devil. It couldn't be. Uh, we done took on it. We don't. We think we got something. It's another programmatic failure. We need God. It looks like the church is going to get there. Who are these from every nation? Who are these from every city? Who are these from every ethnic group around the world? These are they that brought in the kingdom. So God is doing his work. I'm not here to curse you. 
I'm here to look at the moment in which we're living and the people and the men of Eshekah had an understanding of the time in which they live. And so they know what, and the question is, what time is it? Are we the group? Are we the group? Let's take the challenge. That's my speech. Awesome. That's the best I can do. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so you, you've already foreshadowed some of the ground we're going to cover, but this is good. This yeah. is good. Um, so I have a ton of questions. I'm sure you have your own questions, um, because I think we want to give you a great opportunity to speak into our current moment. Um, but before we get to that, I'm aware that either in the room or maybe via live stream, there might be a lot of folks who don't know a lot about you or don't know a lot about Christian community development. And so I wanted to just briefly kind of cover some ground just to give you a chance to share more about who you are. Um, so I'm a firm believer that all of us are byproducts of the people and places we've come from, um, the experiences that we've had. So I'm actually curious from you, what are the people or experiences that have made you the person you are today? Are you asking me the philosophy now and what motivated me or the motivation of philosophy? I think take it anywhere because, you want to take. Because <laughs> God calls and he's saying, we don't dream this up. All of you that's here tonight that really want to do this feel some sense of calling. So what is the calling? I'm sort of an architect, a philosopher. And Jesus says, the wise man built his house upon a rock. We can talk about a lot of stuff, but I think the difference here, we have tried to deal with the biblical incarnation of principles of life. So what is the calling and the engagement? And what pattern do we have when Jesus, the incarnated God, comes and announces his mission, he says, the spirit of the Lord God Almighty is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the neglected. Preach the gospel to those who don't own any land. They don't have a way to be enfranchised back into the society. And they had something they called justice was the Jubilee. So he made, and, and there was a lot of sick people. He healed them, and he said, the spirit of love's wrong. There was a lot of hungry people. He, he fed them. And you, you, you start with unmovable truth. He doesn't seek God because God is true. You must seek him in spirit and truth. You have to take one of his obedience and obey that one and build on that. Grace is built upon that. He adds to. And so we've got some truth foundation. We understand the kingdom of God a little bit. So now what is the engagement? The engagement is the call. We hear the voice of God. It's sort of responsibility. And your responsibility really is to hear and listen with the idea of obedience. And he that seeketh after God, and he even promised us a blessing. He even promised a blessing. We don't have to have prosperity. All we have to do is obey him. And that's proper. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you can ask what you will. But we haven't built it on truth. We have many times built programs to fix what God needs to fix in us and through us because we are broken first. We are broken. The earth itself is traveling, waiting for the redemption of the Savior. And the first thing we got to know we'll send us broken. And what we think that we have broken one more than others, and we color-coded that. We racialized that. 
in our society. And if we didn't realize that that was God's real mission, is to reconcile us back together by forgiving us of our sin. Sin is against God. All of us, we don't sin much, and we make it somebody else's fault. We could even make the Republican, the Democrat, it's somebody else. But we are sin-making machines. What affirmed Jesus as being the Savior, he took the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Sin is ours. We are broken. Someday we will stand before the throne of God, and it won't be what somebody else did to me. So, so what is the engagement? I th so I think the engagement is passion. From which comes passion? If you listen to Jesus' incarnated life, he said it right away. He said it earlier to Nicodemus that, 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 that you had to start over again. Again, and so passion. So what is passion? Passion is to enter into the brokenness of others. And when you are in begin, and so you see the pain. When Jesus got here, he saw a pain. He fed a lot of people because a lot of people were hungry. He healed a lot of people because a lot of people had disease. He met them around the felt need. He wrecked them around the inherited dignity. He didn't profile them and color code them. So the big question of religion is not just motivation speakers. What is the pain of others? The Good Samaritan is that picture. The Good Samaritan was adequate. There was two, there was a Jew in the ditch. And there was two, uh, and a mixed breed guy, biracial guy, came along and picked him up and said to all of us, go do likewise. How do you love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your sign? Reconciliation is a sign of redemption. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God has given to us the ministry of God. Uh, so, so, so the question we keep asking, can, do we feel empathy? Can we, can we hear? I think it starts with the dignity. I don't think we can put it off. I don't think we can put it off. anymore in life. So I yeah. think those are the questions. What motivates you? Yeah. What drives you? What is your deep desire in, in life? So I think those are the kind of questions, instead of us making them just programmatic, they become programmatic. Become programmatic then be, because they become prototypes of what you want to build. If we can't show people that there are people who can live together, and, and then reach out to that community. And that we can begin to be the people of God. We can begin to love people. And that Jesus makes it a finality. Love is a finality. In Rome, in 1 Corinthians 13, he compared all other good things you can do with love. And he said, if you don't have love, you don't have nothing. So our, our programs are wonderful. They create opportunities, but they are not redemptive. They are places where we learn how to be disciples, where we get to know each other. That's unquestionable, that the purpose of man in the world. My friend Rick Warren became the best-selling author in the Christian history of the world. 
And he said it's a purpose-driven life. God has a purpose for our life, and that purpose is for good and not for evil. And that God, in his searching for us, is seeking for people and calling people to give them that emotion, that passion. To enter into the pain, I think we're doing that. I, th I think we're doing that. I, th I think, I think trying to be intentional. We got to be intentional. It cannot be accidental. What looks like accidental are miracles that God pulls off. What looks accidental that God pulls miracles and makes them. We know that you are teachers sent from God. Because no man can do these miracles that uh, you're doing unless in God be with you. And he said, well, you've got to be born again. Right. Your old life is going to lead to death. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The devil tried that with Jesus. That's what affirmed him as God. And that's why salvation is in Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so I think those are the, those, and, 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 and because most of the program, most of the questions become programmatic. Now, we didn't develop programmatic. In fact, we took an old Chinese poem and developed our programmatic stuff, the three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, 2,000 years ago, some Chinese scholar said, go to the people live among them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know. You ain't patronizing yet. You ain't patronizing. You ain't patronizing. What you're doing is evaluating and learning the community. Learn what people are already doing. And how do we engage, how do we affirm their dignity in people's lives? Uh, so I, 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 I think our, our question is has got to be architectural. They've got to be anchored in truth. He that come to God must believe that he is. So God creates a searching. Abraham didn't go out on his own. It said he scattered them, and he found the most high God. And if you answer the question that what did Abraham find when he found God, if you answer those questions, then you have the purpose of man's existence. I'm putting that into my, into my, what they call it, manifesto. This is a good manifesto. Don't get scared. Don't get scared. This is a good manifesto. <laughs> the, the five first books of the Bible is a manifesto. It's what God promised you were going to do. And Deuteronomy said he pulled it off. He pulled it off. So let, me, let me follow that up. So yeah. there, you covered a lot of ground. There are a couple of themes that I think kind of <laughs> bubble to the surface for me. Right? At one point you talked about the role of calling and also the role of motivation. And I think that's a really helpful way to think about the work that we want to engage in because there is this difference between the programs that we run and the motivations and the callings and the energies that sustain those programs. Right? Um, and so moving forward, I'm kind of curious about another term you brought up, which is reconciliation. And I think that in our culture, um, reconciliation has become a, a more contested and debated term. Um, I feel like I've heard a lot of things in recent years uh, where people might say, reconciliation isn't a helpful term because it might presume that there's a time in American history when people were actually together. So maybe consolation is better. Um, I've heard other people say, well, reconciliation is great because it's a biblical term. Um, but maybe it's been misused because it hasn't always involved repentance and repair and actually addressing systemic change. So I'm actually curious um, for you, how has your understanding of reconciliation changed over time? Oh, it has changed a lot. I just had, a, I first had prostate operation of cancer about 26 years ago. I got rid of that one. In no December uh, 27, I had a colon cancer, and I got rid of that one. But when I was out one night, I saw 
looked like there were blocks. I'm in another world. And it, on that block, I'm talking little blocks that we use for children learning, first learning. That's the first learning. And on that, all when you look at a block, you can see almost three sides of it. That's what makes it so learning. And, uh, and, and it said the same thing on every side. And it said, uh, John Perkins stopped searching for meaning. You didn't find me, I found you. And I've given unto you eternal life. And you're still working for your salvation. If you would have met John Perkins, I would have quoted 90 times. For by grace, and I would have had an excuse for the way that I'm keep on working to get the crown at the end. He promised you the crown, and he said, "So I learned something. I learned <clears throat> by me just works is the evidence of what I'm doing. Good works are good. It shows the unsaved that we're saved." Even when we do it collectively. That's why I'm doing it collectively. That's why Habitat for Humanity is so good. That's what are y'all are doing. I'm not against the gathering. I'm not against the, uh, the, 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 the coming together and the program. I'm saying, but the program must be anchored within the solution. And the pro Jesus had a feeding program along with his gathering them together to hear him preach. And when he got hungry, he said, feed them. You, you get that here? So what we need is an integrated theology. We need a theology of holism that speaks to the more multifaceted. Answers to problems, not yes and no, altogether. It, they are all three-sided. It's the truth and an error in what I want to do. And you, the what I want, gets the priority. You get that idea? So, so I, I think it's, it's, I'm really telling people to come back to the Bible again. And I'm really telling people to read the Bible and build their uh, ministry on the parables that Jesus taught. And the number one parable in the Bible is that the sower went out to sow. And the sowing of the seed is the word of God, not money. Not money. That we are to participate in that. We are to work. We are to till the ground. We are to sow the seed, but the seed got to be sown. That's the foundation of life. And so I, I think it, that our religion is becoming folklore. Our religion is becoming who shot Shorty, who killed J.R. Who, you, it's, it, and, and so we create then motivation to go with that. We need motivation with the initiative. And the initiative should be the pain and the brokenness of people. Jesus came in and entered the brokenness of people. He affirmed the inherited dignity that all humankind was created equal. It was endowed by their creator. You can't get around that one. All you're doing is building programs. Build them. Bring them together to feed them, to talk to them and then feed them. Do that. Yeah. And of course, you know that eating is the best exercise of all of your senses. Did y'all know that? If you want to do something together that revives your senses and probably your longing, probably your passion, because you smell the food, you see the food, you taste the food, and you touch each other. 
That's about the senses. And, and boy, that's what the communion was about. It was a cut down version. It was about a supper they had just had that was so joyful. He said, you're not going to do this one again until you do it in the kingdom of God. But in the meantime, let me give you a little prototype. Oh, Jesus loved prototype. <laughs> and that's a little bread and a little wine. Those are sort of the basis of life. The blood represents uh, Bill Gates and I together on the program. Because he says that you can know almost everything about the human body by the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why I wrote one blood. You can almost learn everything about God. That what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's a problem. So I want to follow up something else you mentioned. So you, Am um, I making any sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> With you. So, so what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, let's get back to some historical basic truth. Yeah. And, 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 and hook that to the purpose of God. Hook that to the will of God. And I, th and, I, and I think we're doing it. I think we're doing it. I think we're doing it. I, I think there's a group of us longing for that. I think that longing itself is coming from God. Yeah. That's super helpful because I, I do think you're right that, like, or maybe this is me putting some words in your mouth, but uh, I think sometimes there's a tendency to get so caught up in the programs of what we're doing that we forget about the inner motivations. And one thing that you mentioned earlier is the role of human dignity, right? And I kind of wonder if we actually all believed in the dignity of every human being, how would that then reshape how we did life together? And so I guess my question would be, where does that, where does that um, struggle come from where we don't see the dignity in one another? And how do we fix that? I society? think it's our cover up of our own sin. I'm, I'm finding that in myself. When I'm having too much trouble and stuff, I go around, I suck at a wagon looking for Satan. And when I get around the wagon, I find John Perry. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm overdoing what I want to do. I done got a little addiction to what it is I want to do. And that's another big sign in a society. We are making the addiction, and then we are saying, what cure the addiction is more of what causing the addiction. And so let's make more marijuana. And let's legalize it. I'm a, we are addicted to ourselves. <clears throat> and it's becoming more addicted to the people who got the most and that we're still making the rich people richer, buffing an apple ought to be a crime. What that's going to do to the people at the top? That number today is about 4%. Uh, somewhere between the 6 and 4% pretty much own the means of production. Mm -hmm. You say, he's a communist. No, Jesus was no communist. In fact, he was near a capitalist. He took the person who was the best steward and gave them all to him. The one who invested it, and he called a guy who thought what he had, his stuff, was going to take care of him. And he called him a fool. He said, I got, your, I got the life. He said, my soul be satisfied. Soul is never satisfied with material stuff. I want more of it. We get addicted to it, and we lock it up in bonds. 
I think we have to come back to the scripture, y'all. <coughs> they that go us for sowing, weeping, entering into the pain of people, will sure to come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheep with them. I, I think that that's our problem. I think our problem is that we got a cursed total for idea of the Bible. It's far to engage me in the lives and the pains of others. It's sort of like loving my neighbors, I love myself, as collective as we can. And I think the church was to be the steward of that. I think the church was to be the steward. Of the church was to be God's people engaged in reflecting his will in the world, not their own. At least a collective will. I mean, Jesus came speaking to a lot of people. 4,000. And, and, and those crowds was the men and the women. Maybe not even counting the women mm -hmm. and the children. It was pretty much counting the men. You get that? So he spoke to a lot of crowds of people. That's our mall. And I don't care how large the church could be. We could break up our church in terms of zip code and then build an extension church around that zip code. There, there are a lot of programmatic things we could do. But we got to build a model that's effective. Yeah. That's helpful. Um, something I, as a pastor, something I think about a lot is, you know, what is the role of the church? And, you know, especially in terms of pursuing some of the things you're talking about, but then I also realized that a lot of the times churches struggle with the same things that the broader society struggles with. And so I'm kind of curious, what message do you think the church most needs to hear today as we think about some of the things happening in our society? Yeah. See, prayer and passion of the same. And so we can listen to prayer is listen to God for his will. And so you tie those two together and you begin to listen to God and you begin to seek after the truth in relationship to this pursuit. You got a good chance to agonize with it. We got a good chance. But we, yeah. we can't lose the absolute purpose. Get as many people you can get. Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's what you're going to say to them. It's what y'all going to do. It's what you're going to plan. And the best thing to do is get people together to pray about our needs in this neighborhood. And then begin to organize those felt needs together and uh, not coming in there. Uh, uh, the, the basic one, the classic one, has been when my good white friends come to help me. I love it. My friends are the greatest in the world. I think friendship is the, is the epicenter of what it means to build a site. But when they come, the first time they come into my community, uh, they will start up a paper pickup campaign. Because they come from a nice paper thing. Yeah. They're used to that. We don't come from that. When we drive up to the parking sign, we throw our cups out the window. You live on a corner street, you're in trouble. In my community, and we got two corners. And boy, we have trash. But well, when white folks come, they're going to pick up trash. And they're going to come back, and they're going to think, we're going to stop what we're doing to pick up trash. We don't have that. And when I was in men Hall, most of those old people had to swim in their head. High blood pressure. Being a man in the black community created heart disease. Just being a man. I don't think people know that. that know that. And so I, I'm almost getting off. Let me get back. Because I'm trying to tell you too many things at the same time. We're tracking. 
but, but, but I'm trying to tell us how we can succeed by getting to know each other. Uh, things like prison fellowship, it may help because it, it's personalized. It. it needs to be personalized before it collectivizes. Collectivizes is how we push it, how we manage it. You bring it, you, you get, you, yeah. you get. So, so it is, it is, how do we eventually take that emotion and that touch, firm the dignity of the people, and weep with those who weep? Now we're ready to go. And we'll do that. American do it. American is good. Americans have, uh, they, they seem to help people they like. My job is to go out and like as many as I can. Let me, let me follow that up a little bit. You know, <laughs> that's your job. That's all yeah. my job. Yeah. Love one another. Love one another. That's what the church is. Yeah. It's supposed to be. But this man, that's the best evangelism. That's the best discipleship. We love each other. So yeah. I think this is what we need, folks. I think we need this kind of uh, discussion, and I think the world is waiting on it. I think the world, no, we can't have it every day. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We can't do it every day. But I think that we need to, at this critical time in history, come back and say, as he was in the world, so are we. We are trying to reflect his kingdom come that his will be done, and that will is to be done to us. Yeah. And through prayer, we listen to him, to hear what he got to say, listen for God's will. Hmm. And I think yeah. that's where the motivation is at. That's really helpful, and, and it's striking to me when you mentioned the idea of, or the verse about weeping with those who weep, and it reminds me of how it's, in the Bible, oftentimes Jesus doesn't fix problems until he first feels them, right? He's with the people. Um, and so it kind of speaks to the importance of you know, are we actually connected to people? Do we actually love them? Are we, are we enduring life with them so that we can then actually address issues? Um, but another question this raises, and this will be my last question before we shift to Q&A, is a question of sustainability, right? Because we can get excited about an idea and then get involved and then burn out very quickly. Some of us have. <laughs> um, but, but, but we live in this city that has tons of individuals, hundreds and hundreds of nonprofits that are all engaged in really good work, right? But then things like August 12th happened, or the disparities that we see in our, in our city that preceded August 12th persist to this day. And so we then ask the question, like, how do we keep going? So I'm kind of curious from you, that, that, how do you sustain that? What sustains your hope when you face those challenges? I think it's, it's the lack of the quality of our discipleship. Mm -hmm. I think it's the lack of the quality of our discipleship. I worry about that with the John Perkins Foundation. I worry about that at every program I ever started. The founders gets a good root, but the other ones become, we hard in to be program officers. And we're going to harm them whether they got an attend to, to study the Bible or not. So it's, it's, it's how do you manage most, what I used to do when I was managing people, I don't do that anymore. We would really have in small clusters uh, a time of devotion every morning. Hmm. And we would lay out, and I would tell people to lay out in those devotions, first of all, what it is we're going to do today. And what is the big issue? And we pray about that. <coughs> uh, uh, but we'd also anchor them in the spiritual. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have no way of discipling. We heart these people based on the, I meet all of these people. They just hard them. I said, why did you? Uh, I was, I'm overqualified. I said, what do you know? Are you holistically? Do you know how to pray? What about pray? I'm a good accountant. 
I'm a good analyst. We need them. But holism is whole people within a whole church taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. We are people of God. <coughs> we are shaping the character of God. What it means to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with those six or seven verses that are called the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it means. So with us to be filled on the, with the Spirit is to roll on the floor, to talk loud and fast. That's good. I talk loud and fast. Uh, but that's good. But you need to be truthful as you try to talk loud and fast. You, 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 you get that? And operate on some principle. What is the meaning of this? What is the thing that we do first? You, you're building a house. And the first thing you do with a house is dig a good foundation. And then the first thing you do is begin to build on that foundation on crossbars. And as soon as you get all that stuff, you know, you're going to put a top on it so you can work when it's raining. You, you know, you're going to maximize your time. And then you're going to start to build a house. The church is sort of a mess thing, and I've already said it. It's sort of based on who shot Charlie. I call it folklore. That I told everybody else what to do. And people are living by what I told them. Did you test that with any sense of reality? As I've already said, then we bring our thought in the church to doctrine too quick. Because once you bring the doctrine, all you do is repeat the doctrine. You don't look at the truth of it anymore. Because you assume that this <clears throat> doctrine is right. And we came to truth before that was true. Don't rush to the scene too quick. Because truth really don't have no end if you can stay with the basic what you're looking for. Because most things have more stuff in it than what is there. There might be stuff that stuff is flowed with is almost as good as the main thing. And so you use that. You use that. And so you've got to keep looking at truth. Truth is eternal. Truth is eternal. Truth is God. And he has provided what is necessary for the world to function. The, the, the problem is, are we good stewards to what God has given us? And how do we utilize that stewardship? Justice is a stewardship issue. It's how we manage God's world without disenfranchising. We don't lock them in the cage on the borders, the ones who had built our farm in the West. You don't find any white folks in the arches in California, outside the owner. You don't find any black folks, when they got out of the South, they stopped that stuff. These Hispanic people from down under. Lord have mercy. Yeah. Lord have mercy on our soul. They are not like us. It's that kind of foolish talk we're talking about. It's that kind of thing, and we're doing it like it's nothing. Well, it actually goes back to what you were saying before about recognizing the dignity of all people. Dignity. Right. If we don't go there, that's where we fail. We are back to dignity. We're here tonight. So how about, let's uh, shift. We have time just for maybe one or two questions. We have two Carolines who both have microphones. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll have one over here. One? Okay. Right there with glasses, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Dr. King said, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, 
but by the content of their character. How do you think white folks and black folks are doing on this scorecard? And we're doing it to each other. I got capacity, I found it when I was beaten in the jail. <clears throat> I found I didn't want to sign it. I had to find the capacity to love white folks. And it wasn't until they began to wash my wounds that I broke over. Yes, yes, that's a big one. And, and that, <coughs> that takes participation. The little children know that in kindergarten. The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier we'll be. But your friend is my friend, and my friend is your friend. Figure out a way not to get together. That's the nature of the problem. And then build a system of that. Yeah. That's the nature of the problem. And then color code it and racialize it. You got some people. You got some people enslaved. You got some people who hate themselves. Yeah. And self hatred is a big one. It's so easy today, it haven't been before that somebody killed somebody and and I think ran out to the graveyard and shot himself. And, and, and people shooting themselves, people <clears throat> putting on uh, destructive vessels and going in and killing them all. We got some problems here, folks. And, and, and the church, I think, is, you got it. My four little children will one day, I have a dream, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin. But the best country. That's what we're doing here tonight. That's what I'm here for. All right. And that's what I'm here for. That, that, that's what I'm here for. I, I'm not going to compromise it. I'm not going to hate you back. No. What has happened to me? I didn't end up in these 60 years developing all of these friends. And I heard a Bible verse. Uh, it might have been almost a folklore. I don't think it was. I think friends are greater to be desired than great riches. That's a motivating thing to me. Because I've got a friend, i got it all. So we got one more question right there. I got you guys. I got you guys. I got you guys paying for this meeting. We got one more question here. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm a student. And... Um, one question I wanted to ask you concerning um, a remark you said at the beginning. Um, you had some strong words about Black Lives Matter, which I disagree with. But I would like to ask you concerning that, when you look at the next generation of movements and people who are working and fighting towards the mission of justice and love, what hope and dreams do you have for this generation in CCDA and without? interpret that for <laughs> What hopes do you I have? Can't, I can't hear good. We got you. Um, what hopes do you have for the next generation of people who are trying to pursue justice? Somebody asked me that all the time. Great. I'm, I'm more committed to the real church than I am with that church that is reflected at the end of time. <clears throat> and the one that started Pentecost. They were there from every ethnic group in the world. They scattered out of there, and they got the Antioch, and they reformed it again. They got the hate monger, Paul, and trained him there. I, 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 I think we want to, that's what I'm afraid that, I think our own problem is our none forgiveness of sin. And they don't know our hate is our own. The Bible said if we hear somebody 
He got all against us. I don't even know I all against him. And you hear about it. It becomes my responsibility, not theirs, because they already hate me. <coughs> it becomes their responsibility, my responsibility to go to them. And if they don't respond, I get somebody else to go. If they don't respond, then God says, why don't you just go to your house and enter your closet and close the door and you pray to the Father in heaven and he that hears in secret will avoid you openly. Y'all ever read that? You can't change people. I can't even change my own children. Once they pass, no, there's a certain age they get and if you miss it in that age, it's going to be difficult. You know, we all go through that. The father is the greatest thing until they get about 13. <laughs> and then it go by questioning. But when you get to be about 28, he comes back to his father. My father wasn't so crazy as I thought he was. <laughs> so, so I think the biggest problem we have is our concealed sin that we like so much we won't confess it. And I think in my closing book, I think that's what pain might do to us. Pain might wake up our concealed sin. Because when you can get away with it, you think that God don't see you. That's one of the strongest attributes of God. God is present. God sees you. He saw Anna when Abraham put out. Am I answering the question? I'm, I'm, am I answering your question? I'm answering. You see, the problem is more of ours than we think. And the great success is to take responsibility. <clears throat> My economic mind, when I worked a whole day for a white man and gave me 15 cents, I asked the question, what does this person have I don't have? I found he had the muse, he had the wagon, he had the hay, and he had the field. And I said, in this agricultural community, I've got to get the hay and the field. That's good economics. And it used to be the best thing in getting started in Habitat for Humanity, said, to have a house to live in. That's redistribution, but it's not a giveaway. Yeah. You just give the excess you would have made with that money. Excess. When Gary and I moved back home after we was in California, we said, we love Habitat. We want to endow us a house. You know, it'll, it'll keep on building every 25 years. It'll keep on building another house. We gave money for one house because this is our home. And I've been on Habitat's board. I like them. You know what I'm saying? And, I, well, and so I just said, keep on, keep on building houses every 25 years. We're going to be gone. Every 25 years, we're supposed to be building our house. Hmm. Oh. We're good stewards. We can't spend it anymore. People are seeing that. One of the good things I'm seeing today, people are coming to, the money managers are helping us. They're telling us how much is enough. You, the rich folks, don't know what's enough. And right now, the money managers say, if you save this much over this much and let us manage it, we'll have enough for you to live. And then they'll say, what I'm going to do with the excess. I hope they say, give it to 
New Horizon. <laughs> Give it to the John Perkins Scholars. Endow it. And every so many years, they get another one. Every so many years, you get... I mean, just as a stewardship issue. Just as how do we... We handle God's resources. And God never give us permanent resources. I don't see why we give them all to the corporation. I don't see why we give them all to the corporation. And in one place, we can start with health care. That ain't costing us nothing. Who owns the sun? Who owns the wind? Who owns the water? But God says the earth is the Lord and the fullness are all. And justice is how we manage that. That's called stewardship. What do you have in your hand? <clears throat> God is going to judge me. I'm waiting to get there. So my mother died when I was seven months old. She died of nutrition deficiency. At the end in my life, I began to wonder what she's going to say when she meets me. <laughs> she, she don't care nothing about my pride, my 17 honorary degrees. Oh, Lord, I like that. <laughs> uh, uh, I won the, I got the Abraham Kaifa Award for preachers this year, last year. Supposed to be the best preacher this year, that year. I got the Chuck Colson Award. Uh, I'm supposed to be the the best that Chuck could do. She ain't gonna care nothing about that. She don't be caring nothing about it. she made a little rich black boy. She gonna say, what did you do for people like me? I'm ready for the question. So that sounds like a That's what the Perkins fellow's about. That's what the Perkin Fellows is about, finding people like her and others. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Isn't that beautiful? It's a Thank beautiful place to end. Thank you all um, for Let's give Dr. Perkins another round of applause. <laughs> Project on, Live, uh, on behalf of Theological Horizons and the Project on Live Theology, I thank you for joining us for this amazing evening of conversation and inspiration, lots to think about. Um, the Project on Live Theology um, would like to invite you to two things. One is a podcast you can listen to on your way home, Can I Get a Witness, the podcast, fantastic stories of people um, in our American history and society who have made all kinds of interesting change, very um, interesting and amazing stories. And coming up, an event called Faith and Doubt in the Modern World on Atheist Delusions and Other Tales of Christianity's Cultured Despisers. So we don't, you know, we just pick the hard, the easy stuff to talk about, right? But that's David Bentley Hart on March 25th. Um, at the Bonhoeffer House uh, on University Circle. There are posters as you go out the door. So we hope that this conversation is just one of many that you'll join us for, um, that you'll be part of the conversation. And we thank you for coming, and we're going to be taken out by our friends. Thank you. Know this song, you can join us.
watching 